back. Everybody can hear me, so I don't want to do the microphone. So it's fine. Good. Otherwise, louder. Yeah, it's a little bit hard. Okay. The what? It's too heavy for that. Yeah, I know, I know. Alright, so, <laughs> how's that? That's better. Good. That's so, good. Ask, okay, a couple of things. So, I sent an email around with uh, a Dropbox link with the image that I'll be using afterwards. Uh, <coughs> somehow I did something wrong. I just sent the email in the invitation for drinks last night. So, you will see it like that. So, it was early. Uh, so, uh, what, I, what I would like to talk uh, is how the Open Compiler works and how you can extend it, right? And why do we need Open Compiler and what can we do on top of it? So, what is relevant? That's my main objective today. And to try to get some of you engaged into it, either to uh, help further its implementation or develop new tools on top of it. Uh, sometimes, uh, I mumble, so I do like blah, 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 so please stop me, ask me any questions that you want, uh, don't hesitate to, do, to ask any questions. So, uh, this is kind of the overview, <coughs> sorry, uh, first I'm going to talk the general Faro compiler, then I'm going to talk about the introduction to the small talk bytecode, so we have already seen a lot of this, uh, but we have not seen an introduction to it, so I would like to try to give a general idea so everybody's on the same page. Uh, then how are we going to generate bytecode with what we call the IR builder? So this is saying that we have an intermediate representation, something that we do not have in the current compiler. And we, was, we will discuss why is that important. And at the end, I'm going to show one implementation of uh, what we can do on top of a new compiler and discuss many others. Okay? So the file compiler. So. The default compiler, the one that we have, it's very old, it's quite hard to understand, and it's hard to modify. So, in a sense, I, want, I don't want to say that it's crap, I just want to say that the guys who did it, they did a great job, right? They tried to uh, enhance it in order to be performant and in order to solve particular problems. But at the moment in which you have to go in and extend it, at least for me, it's quite hard. And it's hard to understand. So the question is, how can we provide a model that is suitable and we can understand it quickly and extend it quickly or un, un, uh, with some guidelines, all right? So the idea is not to have uh, a compiler that's really hard to understand or that we, one is scared to go in. So the idea is to uh, really help the user to go in, okay? So uh, the, I took this, this slide from one of my supervisor's courses on, concurrent, uh, on compiler construction, Oscar Niestres, and he, list all the things that we would like to do in a compiler, so things that might, we might feel uh, interesting about doing. So uh, we want to have output run faster, we, have to, we, have to wa we want to perform to make the, the compiler run faster, uh, we want to have a good diagnostics for the syntax errors, we want to uh, work so that the debugging capabilities uh, work fine, uh, we want to have flow and anom anomalies analysis, right? So that's really important. So when I try to go into the new compiler, analyze all the things of how would we in, in, uh, implement this in the new compiler, I found myself in a big of a problem, right? So it was not easy for me to do that. So, what do you call so we can do flow analysis, right? So sometimes you can find, uh, yeah, so that's one. You have another one. So when you do flow analysis, actually flow analysis is one of the basic uh, tools for doing optimizations, right? Flow analysis optimizations. Like of the suit framework or something. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, a, it's built in McGill. So it's a McGill University in Canada. So it's a, they do flow. You mean in general? Yeah, absolutely, right? But you, you might want to introduce optimizations that go perhaps what C used to do, right? So they do flow analysis on different types of intermediate representations to get different kind of, uh, of optimization. So basically the cool stuff is that they, they have different kind of uh, intermediate representations, so three others, three addresses intermediate representations, and they can apply the C uh, of old C optimization problem and new optimization, right? To a stack base uh, bytecode. So that's the general. Variables which are used 
Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, so, ja. Is that good? Everybody's here? Good. So, this is kind of a general thing, right? So. And we have consistent predictable optimization, which is we have no optimization. <laughs> That's a good one, yeah, yeah. That's it. But it would, be, it would be really fun to see if we have uh, what optimization we can do with the current compiler, right? So, and what could we do if we have an intermediate representation or different kind of intermediate representation? Of course, this is costly. Yeah, sorry. That is then uh, more relevant for the uh, inliner. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Am I am I might step, step in someone's food? No, no, no. That's good. So, so, but the, in, in general, the, 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 the small talk compiler, uh, it is important to not do too many optimizations because else it's really difficult to do a debugger. No, I agree on that. I agree on that. So, for instance, this this framework, I'm kind of I'm I'm uh, familiar to this framework. It was not used as a main compiler, right? So it's kind of you apply it afterwards, yeah. perhaps so when you want to. In general, do for compilers, this is correct. But in the case of small talk, take the bytecode. Yep. Optimizations are difficult because you always need to, <coughs> to uh, implement the debugger in a way. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So that you always need to take the small yep. talk. Yep. Don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? All right, so why do we care, right? So what we could build. So I'm going to show you some tools I've just mentioned now, and then I'm going to discuss it a little bit further, of tools that were built uh, on top of the, this Opal compiler. So one is byte searching, which is a runtime bytecode transformation. So you can take the bytecode and transform it, apply transformations to it. So it's an API for applying transformations on top of it. It's very nice. You can do quite some with it. Then we have another tool which is called change boxes. Uh, with basically models change, changes as, as, a, as a box, right? So it, it, it introduces changes in the system and, and manage them as a single set, right? So you can install them and have different change boxes in the system at the same time and have a context of it to say, okay, now I want to see this, this set of changes, now I want to see these other set of changes, okay? Uh, another tool is what Marcus did for his thesis, which is called reflectivity. And uh, it's built with other tools, Persephone and Shepetto, which is basically uh, a reflective system for doing partial behavioral reflection on unanticipated partial behavioral reflection. So you can, you can go in the system and you introduce change it at runtime. And basically this is done on top of the AST. So you go to the AST and you attach new things that should happen in the AST. And so you get into the flow of the compiler and you have a different output at the end. Okay, those are the things that we can do. Another system is called Elbetsia. This is what Lucas Rengli did for his thesis. Elbetsia is a DSL, so it's a context-specific language with homogeneous tool integration. That doesn't say anything, but it's a cool title. <laughs> what it means what it means is that uh, you can define multiple different DSLs, right? Suppose you have a method. You can have different languages inside the method and have a contextual way, because this is really hard. How do you parse that, right? So you have different pieces of code that belong to different languages. How do you parse that? So in this way, this provides a framework which you can define different contexts for that to be parsed by different uh, by different passes. Yes, Igor. Yes, and one of the important uh, requirements for compiler for compiler in order to do that to make it really pluggable as architecture. Yep. Yep. To not to not to, uh, if this is the reason to not optimize too early because yep. otherwise Absolutely. the beta won't be able to yeah. Manage. yeah. Yeah. So we have to the cool the cool part about having kind of a um, a component based compilers that then you can really decide, okay, let's move this here and because I think we can do stuff at the beginning when we have much more information, and then when we go to lower levels, we can apply all this optimization or afterwards, right? So you can decide these things. You can move them around. And finally, I have to, uh, this, is Albedo, uh, this is another system called Albedo. This is my thesis, which is kind of a step forward in the reflectivity point of view. So this is a system, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later, quickly, uh, which is a system that you can go in and from you just don't have this abstraction of AST. You just can attach a meta object to any object in the image and completely change its behavior or its structure. Okay, so you have full uh, reflection environment here. Okay, so my main objective with this is try to say why do we care about this. So the Opal compiler, you will see the, the website is at the SCG Opal compiler, so you can have information there. You can get the latest image and. I think there is a presentation. I will put this presentation in there too. So, uh, an overview. So basically, what we have, it's a we have reified 
every single step of the compiler. Okay, so we have a scanner and a parser, right? All together, which is the RB parser. We use we use the RB parser, and this is the refactoring browser for those of you who don't know it. Uh, then we go to the semantic analysis, which we have this, uh, a class that molds the semantic analysis. Then we go, we have the translation to IR, right? To transform from the AST to the intermediate representation. And then we have the bytecode generation. This is kind of a general overview. So how it looks like, it's we have the code, we have the scanner, right? And the parser, sorry. Then we have the AST, we get AST out of there. Yeah. What do you say? Sorry, that's a good question. So AST is abstract syntax tree. So this is uh, a tree organization of the structure of the source code, right? Everybody's there? Abstract. abstract, abstract syntax tree. Is that okay? Okay. So it's a it's a representation of the source code with extra information in a tree like uh, in a tree like structure. Okay. Good. That was a good question. I didn't think I was explaining that before. Sorry. Uh, then we do a semantic analysis, right? So we have to. So up to up to this point, we have just uh, names, but we do not know what is what each thing is. So we have a semantic analysis in which we analyze uh, uh, things like the scopes of the variables, uh, which are variables, which are literals, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the code generation. So the code generation now, it's, it's divided right f uh, in two parts. So we have from the AST, we go to the intermediate representation. So we build intermediate representation. Then we, we get the intermediate representation. And on top of that, we do the bytecode generation, OK? So this is the perhaps the most important step. Yeah. So collection uh, so in in in, uh, in, car, in our current compiler, uh, we don't have the intermediate representation. So the question is, what is the benefit and uh, why do you need it? Uh, so I mean, if if you can, uh, if the current compiler can uh, generate bytecode right from AST, so why we need this additional step? Okay. The designation itself is required because uh, when you have an intermediate representation, you can apply changes. So it's kind of, you have, sorry, you have the AST, you have the intermediate representation, you have the bytecode, right? Just a second. So the, the thing is, when you go to an intermediate representation, you are a step closer to the bytecode, but you are still a bit, little bit abstract. But you have information that it's, it's going, so it's information related to what would happen in the, in the bytecode, but it's not complete. So for instance, you don't have indexes, because it's really hard to, when you're in the bytecode, right? And you want to, what we are going to see later is in byte search and you're in the bytecode, you have to know that you, if you touch this index and you do that and you do this, you have to change the indexes of the method, right? So the, of, if you add the temp, right, all the indexes are, are going to change. So that's really hard. So if you have an intermediate repre representation, it's like something really similar. It's in between the AST and the bytecode. And you can do transformations there. Yeah. Where there's an abstraction yeah. away from all of the concrete uh, uh, numeric yeah. interpretation on, on the, on the, on the bytecode, and, and you don't have to fiddle with bit fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it is a, um, a perfect model of the bytecode. So there's a one to one correspondence yep. between elements of the intermediate representation of the bytecode, but uh, there's. It no abstracts, yeah. To. It abstracts away the, the, the particularities of the bytecode, basically. So when, when we. Uh, Compilers based on on the compiler that uh, Anthony Hannon did in the, in the past, and when I looked at it, I was at first a bit. Do I really need that intermediate representation? Making all these objects no, this, and I, and sometimes I think it's a bit too much because it's it's a really simple machine in the end, but it brings a lot of niceness to it. So one thing is that we have a really nice symbolic <coughs> assembler that we will see later, that is really usable by normal people. And the other thing is that the bytecode transformation gets really trivial because bytecode transformation is, is hard because adding an instruction somewhere in the code might mean rewriting jumps. And that can. Yeah, that's another thing. The jumps are. I have a question. It's just a step. So, nicely speaking, like the AST is nicely and fires with two jumps. I said, oh, we have a Lego Mindstorm box or something like that. Why don't you combine bytecode with AST? the visitor and you compile by code to the Lego box and we have fun. He came back three days and he said, there is no visitor this week. I said, what? 
There is no regulatory scheme. So we know all the bike codes is not coded everywhere in the, any method. So you said yeah, yeah, the, it's, it's so with this and yeah, infrastructure, you can do that? See, yeah, absolutely. Okay. But the idea, the idea is like, let me give you an example. So, for instance, when you go and you look at the at the at the compiler that we have right now, so you look, so the AST, the the RB AST that we are using are not there. There is another AST, and the emission of the bytecode is inside this AST, right? So when you have to touch, everything is there. It's in the nodes of the AST. Everything is the emission of what is the bytecode I have to create from here. So that makes it really hard to understand. This this everything is coupled in there. It's, it's a single place, and everything is there. Yeah, the thing is that you can take this. So think about from a from polymorphic point of view, right? From a modeling point of view, you can come here and say, okay, I take this, I throw it away, I put something else, and I do something else, right? So this modular way of having it, and, and the IR is the same, right? So that's really powerful, okay? And it, it's the same for this. You can you want to create a different IR that does some changes. So that's why you put your transformation here. Basically, you take this one and put another one, or you add new things here to generate something else, right? So that's that's the idea of this modular way. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the bytecode set afterwards, right? So we're going to talk especially about the, the closures bytecode set. We, we can discuss that there. Okay, everybody's here up now? Good. So, okay. So there are two design decisions that we took. So this is kind of general. So we have visitors to transform. This is what the staff was talking about, right? So we have visitors to transform every, you can apply a visitor to every single transformation in the in the chain of the compiler to change to change how uh, the natural behavior of the compiler works, and then something that we saw in the what the hell yeah something that we saw in the in the old compilers that they change the AST while they are running they, they are touching the AST while they're trying to produce something so you get a, a basic AST at the beginning of the compilation and then they, they start modifying it which is kind of hard to understand when you step somewhere in the in the compiler, you don't understand when these changes happen, right? So we are keeping the AST how it is, and then we apply uh, different transformations to it afterwards, right? So there are stages in which we do this. All right. So uh, here I go to the to explain the AST how how an AST the, the one that we used, which is the RB AST, the refactoring browser AST, looks like. So so it encodes the syntax, right? Uh, there's no semantics yet, and it's the RB tree, right? So we have visitors, we have transformations, we can replace, add and delete. This is built in the in the RB uh, nodes. Uh, this is the pattern directed tree rewriter. Uh, we will talk about that later. And then we have pretty printer. So some of the nodes that of the RB are there. So we have a main hierarchy, which is the RB program node. Then we have the do it node, method node, return sequence, values, right? So <laughs> RNA node, assignments, and so on, right? Every single uh, feature of the language is defined by the RB AST nodes, okay? Questions? Okay, good. So previously, uh, in the Opal compiler, we were using SMAC. Everybody knows what SMAC is? It's a kind of compiler compiler. <laughs> okay, the real answer for you then. Okay, so basically it's a compiler, co compiler, uh, it's a motor compiler, compiler, right? So very much like the ones, pre if you did a compiler, const uh, compiler construction course, you pretty much saw Lex or Yark all time ago. And you can build LARL and LR1 uh, parsers. Uh, what we did is to move to the RB parser. Right, so we are using the RB parser. You will see that we are reusing the RB parser, and this is what we are doing right now. The RB has a parser to generate the AST, right? In the future, we would like to introduce Petty Parser that Doru uh, Tudor is going to talk about this afternoon. 
it would be really cool to have Fetty parser as the main parser of the, of the OPER compiler. All right. So I can take the RB parser and say parse expression 3 plus 4. And what I get is basically, if I, I explore it, I get. Do you want to show it? We will see. <laughs> Wait. First, do you have an idea? Uh, a message node and. We have the parent, so there is a there is a tree structure, right? So we can go up and down, we can we can traverse this tree, and uh, we have the different parts. So we, we can see that there is a literal node which is the three, right? And we have a message node which is the plus, right? And the on the internal part is the the other literal token. Uh, where's the four? Yeah, it doesn't show. Okay, let's see it inside the image. Is that okay? Ah, oh, there. That's good. OK, let's have a look. So everybody who wants to try it out, you, got, you have the image, right? So you can try it out no, in the image. Get the image. Yeah. Your with the link. No, no, you didn't get it? No, but no, maybe. In the, I sent it to the, to the group. Yeah, it's the same structure. It's about the drinking. It's Sorry about that. You have yeah, some. It looks like you can download it somewhere. No, but get it from here. So check the emails. You should have get it. If, so did the other ones receive it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it should be there. Just an observation that just a few weeks ago I was uh, frustrated in slang at not having a parent link and having to search the entire ASP from, yeah. from the top to just discover the parent. The parent is. <laughs> very useful. Yeah, these kind of structures help a lot, right? So. Everybody can see there? It's fine? Yeah, that's good. So let's play it. That, that looks good. OK, so we said uh, 3, 4. Is that correct? OK, so it's a couple of things. So this is the main, uh, this, is, this is the compiler, the new, uh, the OPA compiler, right? Which is strangely called Clochure Compiler, but it would change. For historical reasons. Historical reasons. It was kind of a big step to put the Clochures in. We suffer a lot. But that was fine. <laughs> no, no, historically, uh, it, it used to have its own closure implementation. Right, that was the thing. It yeah. had a different closure uh, right. implementation, which, which worked by not modifying the byte first name. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And but we've. We've compiled to keep the name somehow. All right. Uh, so basically what you do is, this is the method to, to make a compilation, so here we have a mock class, right, that we put there just to not modify any other class, and then you have the classify and the notifying, this is not necessary right now, and it failed, right, so if I inspect that, right, what I get is, I, I get the AST, right, so it's a, so as you can see this is an RB method node. Right, so this is what we get if we compile that, and the structure of this. <coughs> skip. So of course the parent of this node it has no parent, and uh, this is a method node, so it has a body, right? And the and the method nodes, the body is a sequence node, so it's a sequence of statements, one after the other. That's the the only uh, that's the only uh, node that the method node that the method node has. So it has a parent, which is actually the, the previous node, which is the method node, and then there is uh, the statement. So the, the sequence node has the statements, which are each of the statements that it's composed of. So if you look at there is only a return node, right? Do you see that this, this kind of a structure is a tree structure, right? So I go in, so I go to the method node, I break it, it has a statement, uh, it has a body, I break it, it's a sequence node, it has sta statements, I break it, and it has several statements, right? In this case, it's just one, which is a return node. Okay. So, of course, the parent is the sequence node. And here, in the value, this is the value, this is uh, what it's going to return. It's a message node. We are sending the message plus. And the arguments, 
right? How many arguments is it going to have? Just one, the four, right? And the receiver is a literal value node, right? It's a three, so it's a literal, literal value node. And uh, then we have an argument which is a literal value node two, right? Everything's fine there? Yeah, Mariano, sorry. Mariano? Yeah, because it's a, it's a kind of uh, what we decide for the model. So basically, if you ask compile, it gives you the AST, right? But you can to the AST, you can tell different things to get the different intermediate representation. You can say it, uh -huh. generate is going to generate a compile method, I can show you, or IR is going to give you the IR, right? Okay. I, I'll, I'll show you. Where is this uh, script node uh, appear from? Because I... Sorry. Is the, is the body so the sequence node is the body of the of the method node? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, all right. So if I do IR here, I get an IR method, right? So I get the diff different structure. If I do generate here, right? I get a compile method. Okay. Let me show you differently. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, which one? Explorer, Sorry. The next slot down yeah, from uh, the return node is curious. Uh, I think that's, I, I really don't know, eh, but I think that could be the, the extra information for the white spaces. I have no idea. Do you have it? The, the RB pass through is a bit special because the reception browser would like to recreate if you imagine you, you transform a method, so you rename something, you actually would like to pretty print it out exactly as it used right. to look like and not with your pretty printer that rearranges everything. And you want to keep the, 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 the white space it's information. Source. So what it, what it keeps, what it tries to keep is not, in that case it's not the source range, but what it actually tries to do is to encode uh, all this information that an AST throws away in the AST nevertheless, so that it can recreate what the user um, really wrote. So you have an AST, if you write two um, parentheses around an expression, the AST doesn't have two because the compiler compiles that away. But the RB AST tries to retain these information. Did you put a dot after that expression at, at the if it's the last expression of something? Uh, what is, um, yeah, what, what, for example, comments, which is not yet working completely or maybe in the meantime, I don't know. So is there a comment on this expression, things like that. And this is really difficult to try to uh, retain the formatting while transforming uh, code mm -hmm. with the um, refactoring engine. And can I just uh, um, uh, change this? Because when I use the refactoring browser to, uh, the, the, the uh, rewrite engine to uh, separate object memory from the, the, the interpreter, I really needed to keep formatting. And um, I had to add some new format preserving transformations and it seems not, I never came up against curious. It seemed to be very simple and just got rid of the thing. So maybe we could re-implement that in a better way. It's not, yeah, it's not completely working. So yeah. we, so took a, we took a look at it with Lucas and it's, so we wanted to have that, but it's not completely working so far. And it is, it is a different problem, a difficult problem. I need to revisit it to, to think about how to, how to do this. Well, I think that the way to do it is you just hold on to the original source range, and then whenever you have to do a transformation, you're forced to do a parse in place, right? Because you're always parsing some sub-expression, and you know from context what what the what the parse looks like. It's very easy to find the existing pieces of text. Right. And then you know you could do things like ask your your child nodes what their source positions are to find out. So I think that you know, if you just keep the source range for each node, the source range is the original source, you get the information that you need. And for example, one of the things that, 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 that the white the, the small book compilers have always screwed up when you format, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is the loss of base on an integer literal. Right? So if you type in your integer literal as 16R something, yeah. when that goes through the tokenizer, that comes out as whatever the integer is. And so when you format the method, which is basically let's let's uh, let's parse it and print the a print, print the AST. It throws away the base. Whereas if you you know you keep the 
there are source range information, you know, the, the, the node can always find the original denotation of the, uh, of the literal. Yeah, but this is, this is a problem inherited. No, that's not a problem. It's just something inherited from the RB ASD, right? So it's not. <coughs> it, no, it's okay. It's fine. Okay. Everybody's there then? All right. Uh, good. So that's how the IST looks like, right? So the way to to traverse this uh, this AST structure is through visitors, right? So the main visitor that we have is the RB problem no visitor, and then we create a new one, and then we visit the tree, the AST tree, right? It just walks the AST tree. So you're going to see if you if you look at <coughs> this class here and uh, all these subclasses, you're going to see quite some different presentations of, of the AST visitors, right? So you can do pretty much uh, pretty much a lot with these visitors. There is not the only way to do it, right? So this is one way of it. You can do whatever way you want, right? So you can go and just open them in whatever way you want. This is going to walk the AST in a particular way. Right? So let's take a, a look at an example. So you define new test visitor, right? And what we are particular, particularly interested here is uh, in keeping the literals, right? So we want to read the literals and have them and do something with them afterwards. So basically, you define a new class. You have different, so everybody here is, uh, is, uh, knows the visitor pattern. So yes? That's good. I like people that answer. Doru too. That's good. Okay, so uh, you can find a detailed explanation of the visitor part in two books. One is the Gang of Four books, the original uh, pattern book, and the other one, which is yeah, I know, yeah. and the other one, which might be closer to what you need, is the Smalltalk Design Pattern Companions book. Right. So there you have a detailed explanation of the visitor part. Basically, what it does, it has this uh, this accept on specific thi things. So basically, it does a double dispatching. So you say, OK, I want to visit you, right? I want to visit this node. And the node is going to say, yeah, well, I accept a literal node, right? So it goes into that way. Yeah. This is the this is the implementation of the the RB problem visitor node. Yeah, but there is a catch. Uh, actually, the, we found a problem. The the, the the names in the the accepts. So when you do the, the visiting, I, I, I change. So it's kind of if you're following them, right? So if you're following the debugger, you go nuts. So that's something we have to fix. But that's no. But really, it works fine. So don't worry. You're you're going to see a lot of implementations. But that's for the people that's very really picky, right? So you follow the thing. Oh, what the hell is that? Right. So it's just that. It works fine, right? No, but that's a, that's a, the old position. That has now. Don't worry about that. Yep. Okay. So uh, basically, what we do is just to say that here we want to have a we add the literal node, right, the value only, to the literals, right, and then we initialize this with a set, and here we have an accessor, and then we, we, when we run it, right, we pass expression. That's what we saw, right, and then we do uh, test based on Visit new, visit new, the tree, and then we ask for the literals, right? And we should get a set with three and four for this case, right? Because these are the two literals that we have. So this method here is going to be only visited when we hit the nodes, li the literal nodes in the AST tree. So, okay. Okay, good. So this is the way of, this is the way of traversing the AST tree. Good. Uh, semantics now. So we need to, uh, it's just not, we, can, we have the AST and everything's fine, right? So we need to have a, uh, a semantic analysis on the AST. So that's done with the AST semantic analyzer, right? So we have this also refined. So there are different passes that we have. Uh, of course, it's a subclass of RB program node visitor, so it's a visitor. And, well, this is kind of already said. <laughs> okay. So this is the most important, right? So 
there is something that we, we need for, for later, which is called scopes. So we need to analyze AST and look at the different scopes that the variables have. So we have, if you have a block, then it's another scope, right? If you have a method, that's a new scope. The class is a scope, right? So we're going to see an example right now. So you have to analyze the scope, and we model each of the scopes, and this information is there then to, for instance, define index when we are going to do the, the bytecode analysis, right? We, we need to define the index of the, of the temps that we're going to access, uh, the index of the instance bar that we're going to access, uh, and then this is also going to be useful for the closure analysis, right? No problem. So let's take a look at how this looks like. Did you get the image, Nuri? No. no. Oh, right. I get one from Hudson. OK, good. The Lucas Hudson, you got? Hmm? From Lucas Hudson? No. From uh, yeah. the Faro one. From the Faro one, it's good. All right, with, good. Uh, with a newer version of uh, Good. OK, so where are All right. So I have here a small code example where we have, uh, we have a block. Right, and we have another blog inside, right? And then we access these two variables here. So the question is, how is this, the the scope analysis going to work? So we get an AST again, right? A little bit more complicated than what we saw before, and so. Okay, so what we can see here is that uh, we have a method scope, right? If you, yeah. Those are mine. <laughs> and you, you mean these examples? Yeah. Ah, sorry, I should have said that. Wait, let me show you something. Just a, <laughs> sorry, just a sec. So there is a cool part about this is that it has quite some tests, and so and these tests are quite nice because you can see a lot of examples there. So you can grab these examples and and run them. So for instance, you have we, we test each part of the of the compiler, right? So if you want the bytecode, in this case, it's an AST. Uh, the yellow one is because we are working on them, so don't panic; it's not completely broken. And in here. We have examples of different implementations, and we, we, you can run and look at the code, right? So it's not, it's not that you have to follow this particular example, but you have a, a bunch of examples here in different sections, right? So you have the AST tests, so you can see how uh, the different part of the AST works, and then you have the, the, the compiled AST transformation works, the IR transformation works. And I think that, yeah, so. Yeah, so basically the name of this test that I'm looking at, the test block te uh, temp, is a test, right? So you can have the, the complete example there. So if you search for implementers, you will find it. Okay. Sorry, I, I stupidly looked at my email, so I missed. Have you given yet an overview of, of what we're trying to do with the closure analysis? What, what we want to try and do with it? I will explain that in, in a couple of slides. Sure. Is that okay? I am, it depends on how we go, how deep we go, because it's, it's kind of, I try to give an overview of what we want to achieve, right? Okay, so where were we? Okay. So the idea is that there is a tree structure too of the scopes. So basically we are here at the method scope, right? So this is in the properties because we didn't want to change the SD, right? So this is in the properties. So this is a method scope, and then we have an outer scope, right? The outer scope of the method scope is an instance scope, right? And if I inspect that, the outer scope of that, it's basically a class scope, right? The idea of this scope is to, so this is the last one, right? So there's not, nothing up there, all right? So the idea of these scopes is to keep track of which variables belong to them, right? So for instance, uh, right, so for the method scope, the variables that we have is block one, right? Block one, 
uh, block two and block. All right. Those are the variables that are defined in this method that belong to this method, to this method uh, scope. Uh, if I go in the body, of course we and I I open the body and I open the statements. We are going to get into some blocks there. So here. Do you see that there are many statements? Yes, there are three statements, and I take the first one. If someone gets lost, just ask me. There's no problem. It's kind of sometimes hard. So, uh, so you see two parts here. This is an assignment node that you haven't seen so far. There is one part which is called variable, which is the assignment part. This is we get, we are assignment block, right? We are assignment block. Uh, all this here, and the value side is a block node that we we are interested. And if I go to the properties here, I get right a block scope. All right, and in here we see that the argument variable is the one defined. Okay, so this is a way of uh, organizing how scopes are defined. So modeling the scopes that are defined in the source code. Okay, and this is particularly useful for later to decide. Uh, to say what to do, how to index them, how to organize the index, because depending on the indexing, you have, we have to name the, the ten variables differently. Okay. Good questions. Good. So, yeah. So this is this is the same example explained. So, so this is this is the how it looks like. So we have four scopes. Do you, can you spot which one are those? Sorry. The scopes, I mean, I didn't understand why you have four. Okay, so we have, so this is the class, we don't see it here, right? This is the instance scope, because this is inside a particular method, a particular object. And then you have a method scope, this is the whole thing, right? Then here, so this is the whole method scope, right? But in here you have block. Right, so this is a different scope. So we enter in another context. Is that okay? Okay. And then inside that we have another another block, right? So that's another context. So that's that's just here block scope. So we have diff two different types of scope, right? The block, the method scope, and the block scope. So and we have two of those. If, if I had a third block that is uh, outside, outside, yeah, that would be, would be that would be under yeah under, under the method node. Yes. Okay. Is that okay? okay. Good. Questions? Sorry, wait. Okay. <laughs> Who was with? Yeah, go. What do you mean the instance scope? So the instance scope is because uh, you can have instance variables, right? So they're going to be defined there. It's that they belong to this instance, not to the class. Okay. And then you have, if you access variables that are class defined, then it's in the class. This is kind of thing I say. Yeah. Yeah, but you can you can also change that, right? So you can have different type of uh, of uh, scope analysis, right? Of yeah, I just mean that it's yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that's true. So th the the other problem is when you go the other way around, right? So when you go go from the because you have to have the compiler, right? Because that's what you're saying. The, the debugger has that. So the problem is much more from a decompiler point of view, in which you don't have all these things. So you don't need to have the compiler. So you, you were saying that you want the debugger, right? You can say that okay, I want to. Ah, oh, right, now I understand, yeah. Yes, that's and different. Size context has its terms and Yep, has absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, class and yeah, yeah. No, no, this is for just this case, right? In that case, but you can you can have that, right? So you have to change the way in the scope, uh, you have to define a new way of scoping. You can have, you, you, you take this analysis, right? And you put your analysis. You can, you can, you can uh, probably there will be some additional scope between uh, Yeah, so that is, what you're doing is basically like taking this and putting it in another place, right? So that's what you're doing, yeah. The class? 
Ja. I really don't know that. I haven't seen an example of that. I would guess so, but I don't know. So in general, the naming is not really nice. So we want to actually revisit that stuff. If we have really the, because normally you talk about global strokes. And yeah. Okay. Uh, back to the question of Igor or something related. If I compile, I <coughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's just a, it goes up to the method only. So it builds a scope for that. It builds a scope, yeah. Actually, you, you also have a do it, it would be a do it uh, AST note, right? So you did, if you saw it, there was a do it yes, AST. There's a, there's a scope <coughs> inserted there for that kind of, uh, I, I don't know, but I think it's a, it's a do it scope, yeah. There was a do it scope. I can check if you want, okay? I don't remember, we can check it. But it builds a scope for that particular. Sorry, is okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Anybody else? All right. <coughs> so, this is the part that Elliot wanted, right? So this is the, Besides in the semantics, besides the the uh, the, the semantic analysis, the, this the AST closure analysis, right? Analyzer. And uh, this historically comes from Lisp. This is a classic approach to compiling closures in the context of Lisp. So this is a uh, stolen from Lisp compilers by Peter Deutsch. And so the, yeah, there is. <laughs> well, you claim you claim that in your blog. So yeah. okay, good. All right. So there's a nice blog post from Elliot in which he explains in detail this, right? It's nice. It's quite low, long, uh, but it's quite... <laughs> no, well, took me some time, all right? So I'm not saying I'm right, but it took me some time to understand. The basic idea, so here we say coping versus stem vectors. I'm going to try to explain that, how that's that work. So the basic idea is that uh, if you have an example like, uh, like this, you have a count and then you have a block here, right? So this is, a, this is a context, a particular context. And the problem with this is that this variable count is going to outlive, right? It's going to leave after we get out of the execution of this method, right? So we have to somehow make this value leave too outside the, the execution of this method, right? So that's the main problem. So how do we do that? So there was a, so the, the, the original uh, uh, Yeah. First of all, it's assigned in counter block the method, and second of all, it's assigned inside the, the, the block, and then the block can also outlive. So the, tri the tri a trivial problem yeah, yeah. Is, is, is how do you get to the variable continuous places, and then a serious problem is, is how do you keep on getting it to it once, once where the variable was in the particular period. The problem is, yeah, the, so we're going to see there are two conditions in which we have to uh, consider this a special case, right? So we will see that right now. So everybody's happy to. Understand the problem here, right? Okay. Who, who does understand the problem? Could you, could you? Okay. All right. So nobody understands the problem, and that's 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 really interesting. <laughs> so, do you remember yesterday when we looked at contexts, <coughs> how concrete contexts were, and that you can think of a context as you know there's there's, there's a sender, etc., 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 and then there's a little bit of stack, and and temporary variables are on the stack, and the arguments of the temporary variables in the first few slots of the so if you see the expression uh, count becomes equal to zero, right? notionally that would be, let's assign to the zeroth slot in the context. Right? So, that, so effectively, you know, we, we want to put zero in that zeroth slot. Right? So that, that works for a normal temporal read. But uh, when we have this block here, now what does it mean? Now when we see count becomes equal to count plus one, first of all, fetching count from inside the block means we've got to find that context. Yeah, you have to go out of there, right? And, and fetch that temporary and, 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 and bring it back. So that's not, let's fetch the, 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 the slot of our context, which is run the context of the block. It's let's fetch something from the context of our parent, right? Of you our, you have to do you have to do an indirection, right? So you have to go out and, and search for it, for the value. And, and likewise, 
when we assign back to it. Right? So when we assign back to it, we have to find our parent and assign to its zeroth slot, not our zeroth slot. Mm -hmm. right? And that, that's great. That works. That's fine. Uh, except once counter block has disappeared, because we're yeah, because to this these inefficient contexts. Yeah, so the, the definition of count is going to die when this block is done, right? So you end up with a block afterwards. You, you are going to return this block, and where is yeah. this variable defined then? Now, if there are no if there are no frames, if there's no stack organization in the VM, this is not a problem, and you can actually assign to the context, and that's what older small talk VMs did. Right? But if you want, yeah, yeah. Well, what they did, they did a horrible thing. <laughs> you see, when, when when I was working on on the the, the Rigorous VM, the way that they they coped with this is that. Um, uh, the, the, the frame didn't go away, but when you, when you exited the frame, you had to copy all of the state back into the context. And every time you, you activated a block, you had to bring the context back into the, into the cache. So activating a, 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 a block meant uh, creating two stack pages, not just, not yeah. just one, it was really slow. So what we, you know, the, the subtleties here are, 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 are really a performance trade-off to do with, with this context of stack mapping in, in, the, in the VM. And the Lisp guys didn't have that conflict, and they came up with a simpler way of doing it in the first place. Because because small talk historically has had context. The natural way to, to do this is okay. Let the block hold on to its parent context, and it will have these bytecodes that allow it to follow the parent. List. But it doesn't work when you want to map. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this 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 thing that that counts notionally lives on the stack on, in the context of counter block. But if it if it really does live <coughs> in in the the, the uh, uh, on the stack of, of the counter block <coughs> activation, there are many problems that we'll have when we actually come to execute these uh, 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 non-local references to those variables in in block. Now, who did that clarify anything for anybody? Yes. All right, that's it good. It took me like months to understand what is wrong with this. Yes. Um, it's hard, because, yeah. Yes, because I was implementing all interpreter for small talk, and it's really difficult to understand because you don't see, uh, when you look at source code, it's everything all right, and, but when you go deep into the uh, interpreter machinery, you have really real problems because once you're returning from methods, yeah. Yeah, and you don't have it anymore. The block keeps the reference to that context, and you have to deal deal with the fact that this variable belongs to the method scope, not to the block. Do you get that? That's what we're going to to see now. Don't worry. So. Up, so here we see the problem, right? So this is go the method is, is going to die, the context of the method is going to die, and this is going to outlive, right? So it's going to go on somewhere, and we do not know when this variable is going, this value is going to be accessed again, right? So th this, when this is going to happen, basically. So we do not know where to load this, right? Good. All right. So I took this. Uh, uh, this quote from edges block and so basically what it says is that we want to break the dependency between the block activation right so what we have there and it's enclosing context of accessing locals right so we want to break this dependency that we have to go up right and search these things so the question is how do we do it and I, I'm not a Lisper right but the Lisp guys already did it somehow and this is what Elliot implemented here so that's what we are going to try to explain do you understand this quote right so what we try to we we're trying to break is this going up and searching this stuff so we're trying to break this in direction. Sorry, so I might be repeating it, but yeah. the, the first problem with, with the block is the one that is not fixed with the fixed term. For fixed term, this is another. It's horrible hard. Yeah. It's horrible hard, but for that, it was that problem. Except it's not, also. No, it's, it was just one case, or a couple of cases, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Right? Good. All right, so 
I have here an example which is the in check into right of collection, and this is also taken from the block. So basically, what we have here is a it's a block, right? Uh, and here we are, we are doing the same thing, right? We are assigning something which which should be next body should be in the current context, right? So suppose I want to fix this from a uh, from a so by hand, right? So how would I go? So what what do I need to do? And this, and the solution is that what I want to do is instead of having these uh, these values living here, right? So I, I would like somehow to always every time that I instead of doing this d differencing, right, this searching every time that I access these values here that are really important, I would like to have them somehow in a in a global context which I can I can access directly. Okay, so instead of doing this, okay, search in the upper, I just when I access them, I know precisely where to access, right? So I break this dependency of searching stuff up. Is that okay? So if I would do it like that, I hope that you can. All right, that's good. Okay, so that's a lot of code. So basically, what, I'm, what we are doing is something that we call indirect temp vectors, right? We define an array. This is by hand, right? We see that then there is a bytecode that does this for us, so we don't have to do it. Just to show you what it would take to do it, and we have an array, right? And then at this, at the, at the first uh, position, we put this value, which is what should have been uh, assigned in next value, all right? And then we do the traditional do, and then what we do is just access the array, right? So basically what we are accessing is the definition of what we have up here. So there's no context or there's, uh, <coughs> there's no indirection. I just directly go and access what I want, right? So what we are breaking is not, there is no that there are two contexts. So if we, we forget about context, it's just I'm accessing things that will define up here. Okay? Is that clear? Good. So actually, yeah. Uh, you mean another block in here? Hmm? Another block in here? Yeah, that would be. Yeah, it's only one temp vector, uh, indirect temp vector. Uh, yeah, it's the yeah the, the upper the upper scope. Yeah, is that okay? The mm -hmm. yeah, the upper scope, the, the method scope is. No, no, it's the, the main scope of the, the unit, so basically it's the method scope, right? But if you do a do it, right, it's going to be the do it scope. That's why I want to say it's like, yeah, okay. okay, good. So, so this is kind of code-like, right? So that's not quite enough. There's something else you had to do, and the, this is where the, the new bytecodes come in. And what, we, what you can see, that the most different thing here is this, do you see that, the clochure copy, right? So basically what that's saying is that I would like to copy, so I would like to copy the cluster, right, to create a new one. This was done before with a push this context, right, a new a push new context. And basically what, what we're doing here is that we have, we copy the, the, binary, the binary block that we needed here, and we copy the indirect, the indirect temp uh, vector, right? But basically what we are doing is that this structure here puts the values of this thing here, and then I can access them directly, right? So this is conceptually, what the bytecode, the new bytecodes are doing. So what we're doing is we are not going up the contexts and searching for these values. We're just accessing them from a kind of global structure. Is that okay? So there is what we are saving, basically the problem when, when we finish this block, so. But this is the first problem. This is the solution. I'll, I'll go to show something else, don't worry. I'm going to show examples now. It, I, there are two cases, so we're going to. So there's a case where you copy stuff, and there's a case in which you. No, no. It's easy to, to see because the array, so what, what used to be in the, in the method context, mm -hmm. now is in an array. And that array is independent. It's a global structure that you can access. This will live on forever. So the method, the, the, the context will disappear. Values, yeah. right? Read values yeah. and location values. Yeah. And what's happened is that the location values, the L values, have moved 
from counter block into a cell, into a slot in an array on the heap. Right? So there's only one place in the, in the, in the system where it lives, it's in the heap, and, and that, that object can live as long as there are references to it until it's collected by the garbage collector. Yeah. So that's, that's what's happened. We've moved the L value from the stack of contents <coughs> into a slot in an array on the heap. And so we've got rid of the problem. So and what we do with this transformation is uh, variables um, never live in more than one place. We can copy the values of variables that never change. If we, you know, if we have some, some temporary that we want to access from within a block, <coughs> we can avoid having to create the heap thing if we know that the value of the temporary doesn't change. We just copy it into another temporary in the, in the, in the block, local to the block. Yeah, basically, what you're, you're, atta you're attacking there is that you're saving the time that they to re recreate this, returning these values to, so I touch stuff in the block, right? So I touch stuff, so I assign things, and then I, what, I, what do I have to do? If I want to have, if I go out of the block, I have to reassign the things outside the block, right? All these returns and reshaping. Uh, can I take a second just to get back into the ideas of inherent? Yeah. A what? A gauntlet. Okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, scope is separate from context. Scope can extend over several contexts. Yes. Correct? We have this problem. This doesn't have this problem. We have this problem because we have context. Right? This yeah. doesn't have context. So we have this problem in small talk. This doesn't. Is that correct? Well, no, that's, yeah. that's not, not quite right. It's almost backwards. You're absolutely right, but you got it backwards. So if you have context, it's not a problem because you can just have the, the block access to non-local temporaries, right? Because execution, uh, activation records are just these objects and, and, and we can chain them together. Okay. Yeah, right? that's if you don't way. have activation objects, you have to execute on a real machine stack. And now you have a problem because the machine stack, activations in the machine stack have LIFO lifetime. Right? They, they, once you return from them, they no longer exist. So you have to find a way of representing variables that outlive their extent. You see why I said it was backwards? I, I kind of, it's like an abstraction between the two, and it's not a deficiency in small talk, it's a choice. And so, so you go immediately to the straightforward You go right to the metal in the way. They're That's always right. going, okay. I, I, I get that. Um, six tenths is historical. We don't use six tenths anymore. I think. I think in 2006 I came in and people would use six tenths and I never understood why. And that's because the scope of the block is separate from the scope of the method. And you, the block, as I understand it, just disappear and gets consumed and you still need those arguments. <coughs> in, and so you, you, you pin them yep. to the method context. Yep. But Yeah, that's true. No, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Elliot fixed that. So, whatever system we have to pin these values to the method context <coughs> after the uh, after the block has been annihilated, that gets taken care of automatically. Yep. So talking about six tenths is really not. Yeah. So something perhaps we have to stress is that you don't have to do anything right now, right? So right. what I'm showing is just the internals so for you to understand. But basically, it happens and you don't see it, right? Right. And the the previous cripple closure implementation now it works fine. So there were some tests for for testing how the closures were working and they were broken, right? right. Until the point that we make. I'm, I'm done now. I understand basically these issues and you're dealing with them. Yeah. There's a key in, in creating a compiler for you. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to okay. Good. Anybody else? Okay, good. So let's take a look at an example, right? So we have here a method and we have an assignment here and a variable here, right? So there are two things that we need to look at when we're going to define which values are going to be copied and which values are going to be into a remote temp vector, right? So which are, we need to be global somehow. There are two cases. So in this case, what we can see is that this variable here is going to be read in the block, right? Is that okay? So what do you think? This should be copied or this should be in a temp vector? Yeah. 
it takes it, it takes some time not for this example to understand the whole thing, right? So why? <laughs> why? Yeah, I know. But <laughs> because you don't need to, to change it. Yeah, because yeah, that's right. So basically, yeah. So basically, it's like I just access the value. And the value I can put the value there. That's it. I copy the value. And that's it. Nobody. I, I don't have to return anything or, or re. No, there's no assignment to it. So basically, I don't have to uh, recopy the after this block is executed. I don't have to go anywhere anywhere to recopy the values, right? But wait, imagine there is a trickier example. I mean, wh when do you make the copy? This is the, the question. Because if I put assignment after the creation of the block. Yeah. Then you need to do something. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to show you an example there. Yeah. So what what's going to happen with variable A? So in this so you go in here in this context or it's going to be assigned to a remote temp vector and you're going to be a So basically what's happening here if you will uh, do the bytecode of this there's a big bytecode here uh, which is going to create this Closure here, right? It's going to push a closure. Um, if we look at it at the level of, 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 of context, ignoring the fact that we need an object to represent the unevaluated block, when we run the block, right, just as when we run the outer method, what we mean by uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the machine by the vertical bars is that we need a slot on the stack to hold A. Yep. What we mean is that in the activation of the block, there's a slot on the stack with A. Two copies of A, and in, and in this case, they'll both be the zero copy. One in the, the zero stack element of the outer method, and one of the zero element of the inner block. <coughs> but there's two. The block exists in two stages, right? There's the there's the thing that says I'm a block, and then there's the evaluation of the block, right? So the the, the block is really the, the 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 closure, and the evaluation of the closure, which can happen many many times. We can we can evaluate this block as many times as we want. Right? The evaluation of the closure has the, the copy. So we also have to have a copy of the variable in the block to copy it to its yeah, to be able to, because otherwise you have to go back, right? So if you copy it, then it's a, it's a unit, of be, uh, unit of behavior. Right? You can take it and put it anywhere you want. It's, it's, it can live by itself, right? So if you copy the values that you need, the thing can live by itself. It doesn't have to go anywhere, the, the returns. So when do the copies happen? So the, copy ha the first copy happens when you create the block. So to create the block, as we'll see in the bytecode, uh, before you create the block, you have to push the value that you want to copy. And when you create the block, you say, I want to copy this many values from the stack. And then the second thing ha the second copy happens when you activate the block. Any copied values in the block are copied to particular places in the, in the stack. And, th and that's what we'll see in the bytecode. Yeah. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's going to when when you see the bike, it's going to be accessed by like this is. Yeah. You you don't have to do it, right? The bike does it for you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Good. Uh, this is a section of bytecode, and I explain the new bytecode. So, there are a, a set of new bytecodes. We can see there. Is that okay? So, it's copied. All right. So, here, what happened? You had, actually, you have three things. So. That's good. I think that you, you know you, you 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 can only avoid the copy if the compiler has knowledge of um, of while true. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't happen. Right? It doesn't. <laughs> so, I mean, 
but the thing is so let's take it let's let's take it apart right eh? okay let's take it apart so uh, we have three variables right we have one block here right and we have another block there right so okay good so let's take the smallest one what do you think about that you what no you cannot copy because uh, you have the white screw and so you can uh, iterate on yeah, yeah, but just take it aside. So take take it apart, right? So look at that. Just one second. So is it is it a copy or is it a remote there? Just look at that one, at that block. That's right. Good. Yeah, that's good. I just want to check if everybody was with me. I would think that in each loop a copy would be um, made of that um, variable, like uh, rule copy each time you run through the loop. Yeah, uh, it's actually it's every time that the the closure is evaluated, right? So. Yes. Yeah, but th there's right, a right. yeah, but there's something I don't want. There was someone. Uh, there's someone I want. No question. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Good. So now let's take the big one, right? So let's take a look at a collection. It's one by one collection. Uh, am I, am I reading it only, or am I assigning something to it? I mean, here for the value for the value of the variable is just reading, right? Just reading it. And here within index. I'm writing to it, right? Yeah. yeah. So what's the problem there? The, I don't know when this thing is going to be evaluated, right? So what do I have to do? Because yeah, if I don't know, then when this thing is, is evaluated and it's done, I have to somehow get the values of index and put them back in this context, right? So the question is, somehow I need to do something with this in order to access it kind of in a global way, right? Kind of saying, OK, every time I refer to this, I'm going to touch it. This thing here in this context is going to be uh, updated, right? So actually, since index, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been written, then it's a, it's a it's a remote, right? It's a, we have to put it in a temp vector. So what has happened here is that we have all the others are just uh, copy, right? But index in particular is going to be in a temp vector. Is that clear? Right? One nice thing that I, now I realize I didn't have is what happened if I so I have an A here. Right? And just a second. If I read it afterwards. Okay, nothing. So okay. Sorry, I was thinking. So index is remote. What I call remote is that it's outside the definition of the of the closure. Is that okay? You're going to see these uh these terms in the blog and in the in the code, in the abstractions in the code. Yeah, sorry. No, because it's it's look, um, uh, uh, ignore. Let, let's let's imagine that index didn't change. Right. Yeah. Uh, the assignment to index when index gets zero doesn't affect it. Assignments to the variable before it is closed over. Assignments to the variable before it is captured in another float. So don't change the fact. It's only assignments in in, that, yeah. in the, the non-local don't add after the non-local. Yeah. The second case, that's the one I was thinking. So if you go here, I was thinking, I don't remember precisely, but if you have here an A, and yeah, wait, an suppose that this assignment, yeah, yeah, but suppose that this assignment right. comes it's afterwards. Yeah, it's inside, that's it. Yeah, that's the first case. If it's inside, that's it. You count it. But, 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 but just take something this way. Yeah, that's, take this one here. Take this one here and put it down. No, that's that's right. That's why it's complicated the analysis. The precise way to say when it needs to be uh, remote is to say if it is assigned to after it is closed over. Yeah. Right. Because that that yeah. one phrase yeah, yeah. describes all of the cases. Yeah, yeah. An assignment inside the block is after it's been closed over by the block. An assignment in the outer method after the block has been created. Yeah, but that's yeah. I understand that now, but it took me. Some time to because it's not, it's not yeah. So yeah, yeah. The, the, the thing is that you, you say that that's perfect, but the problem is that most people don't don't follow that. Yeah, you, that you have all these different cases, and actually the rule for priority as well. <laughs> you know that. Thing? So Adele Dolberg told me this. This is great. She was talking about how uh, uh, precise definitions 
uh, work and, and how people come to understand concepts. And, and she was uh, delighted that the, the rule with French roundabouts, which, thank God, is no longer the rule <laughs> with French roundabouts, because I think it kills hundreds of thousands of people a year, but never mind. Yes. Uh, the, the rule with, with French rest, uh, 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 roundabouts is called priorité à droite, that you give priority to person coming from the right. That means in France, when you advance, because you drive on the left, you advance to a roundabout, you stop, because there's somebody coming in, right? And then as you come round, you, no, it's, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. <laughs> you're, you're on the roundabout and you stop for the guys coming in. It's insane, right? You're halfway around the roundabout, it's like, yeah, no, and you, so you drive up the roundabout as fast as you like and then you have to stop. But when you go to the UK, where the rule is, once you're on the roundabout, you can keep on going and you give priority to the person who's coming onto the roundabout, priorité à droite is exactly the same because you're driving on the other side of the road. So if you express <laughs> the rule of priorité à droite, it works both for French roundabouts and English roundabouts. And she thought that was fantastic. Of course, that doesn't correspond to people's mental models at all. Mental no. <laughs> models is, I want to stay alive on this roundabout. <laughs> Let me a couple of more slides and then have a break. Is that okay? Good. So I go and I will be with what's left. So we spend what's time. Okay, good. So now intermediate representation. So this is the next part, right? So we talk about what's happening in the AST analysis. So intermediate representation, it's semantic like bytecode, yeah, but it's more after. That's what we said. So we don't have indexes, we don't have uh, so the jumps, we're going to see afterwards, the jumps are jumps to, not to a particular position, but just the jump to a label, right? So in that way, the intermediate representation is different. And so you build the intermediate representation by applying what is called the AST translator, right? So we translate the AST uh, with this class to an intermediate representation, right? Of course, it's a visitor, right? And it uses something called the IR builder. So the IR builder is a quite nice class in which you just tell them what you want. So I want to push temp, I want to push this temp, right, this name. I want to add these temps to the, to the context. I want to jump to this position, to, to this label, if you want, and so on. And you can pretty much define it in a very scriptive way. So let's take an example, right? So we have, a, we have push literal, right, 34, store inst bar 2, pop top, push inst bar 2, return top, IR. So basically what I say is generate the IR to this guy. So what does this mean? What do you think? We will see bytecode in detail afterwards, but don't worry, just to have a feeling. So what do you do? I, I push a literal, right? So I push 34. Is that good? Good. So I store inst bar two. So what is that? I'm putting, yeah, I'm putting that there. With the 34 in the instance bar. In the second instance bar. Good. I pop the top, and then I push the instance bar again, the second one, and then I return the top. So I'm returning. You return the instance bar in That's good. Okay, a little, little bit complicated. This is the bytecode, right? So you see that uh, basically the indexes thing is different. And basically we can we can talk about uh, positions or names. So we will see examples of this afterwards. So that's the important part. Good. Yeah. We will go into detail, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that's the problem, right? Because you have to know all these details. So the IR just hides them for you. And then we go to the, so we, we are done with the IR and then we go to the bytecode generation. So the bytecode generation is done by the, uh, the bytecode generator, right? And uh, so it, it's the one who builds the compile method. It's what's called when you say generate to an AST, AST tree, right? It's what we saw with Mariano, right? So we say generate to an AST and we get that. If we say IR, we get the IR, right? Uh, and here we have an example. So we have a test return one. So what we want is to return one and we have push literal one, return top IR. So, and then we have the, we can ask for the compile method, right? And then we can evaluate it. And we're going to get one, right? So that's what it says here. So we get a value with receiver Right, so there is no receiver. Argument, there is no argument, and then we have one. Is that okay? Okay, so we are going to 
go on with the biker after the after break, yeah.